Chengdu, also known as Xanadu, was the capital of Kublai Khan's Yuan dynasty in China. Before he decided to move his throne to the Jin dynasty capital of Zhongdu, which he renamed Khan Balik, present-day Beijing, Shangdu then became his summer capital. Shangdu was visited by the Venetian traveler Marco Polo in about 1275 and was destroyed in 1369 by the Ming army under Zhu Yuanzhang. In 1797 historical accounts of the city inspired the famous poem Kublai Khan by the English romantic poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Description Shangdu was located in what is now called Inner Mongolia, 350 kilometers north of Beijing, about 28 kilometers northwest of the modern town of Zhuolin. The layout of the capital is roughly square-shaped with sides of about 2,200 meters. It consists of an outer city and an inner city in the southeast of the capital which has also roughly a square layout with sides about 1,400 meters and the palace, where Kublai Khan stayed in summer. The palace has sides of roughly 550 meters, covering an area of around 40% the size of the Forbidden City in Beijing. The most visible modern-day remnants are the earthen walls though there is also a ground-level, circular brick platform in the center of the inner enclosure. The city, originally named Kaiping, was designed by Chinese architect Lu Bingzhong from 1252 to 1256, and Lu implemented a profoundly Chinese scheme for the city's architecture. In 1264 it was renamed Shangdu. At its zenith, over 100,000 people lived within its walls. In 1369 Shangdu was occupied by the Ming army and put to the torch. The last reigning Khan, Tofan Tima, fled the city, which was abandoned for several hundred years. In 1872, Stephen Bushell, affiliated with the British legation in Beijing, visited the site and reported that remains of temples, blocks of marble, and tiles were still to be found there. By the 1990s, all these artifacts were completely gone most likely collected by the inhabitants of the nearby town of Dolan in order to construct their houses. The artwork is still seen in the walls of some Dolan or buildings. Today, only ruins remain, surrounded by a grassy mound that was once the city walls. Since 2002, a restoration effort has been undertaken. In June 2012, Shangdu was made a World Heritage Site. Description by Marco Polo the Venetian explorer Marco Polo is widely believed to have visited Shangdu in about 1275. In about 1298-99, he dictated the following account, one of the most complete descriptions of the city as it existed. And when you have ridden three days from the city last mentioned, between northeast and north, you come to a city called Chandu, which was built by the Khan now reigning. There is at this place a very fine marble palace, the rooms of which are all gilt and painted with figures of men and beasts and birds, and with a variety of trees and flowers, all executed with such exquisite art that you regard them with delight and astonishment. Round this palace a wall is built, enclosing a compass of 16 miles, and inside the park there are fountains and rivers and brooks and beautiful meadows, with all kinds of wild animals, which the emperor has procured and placed there to supply food for his gerfalcons and hawks, which he keeps there in mew. If these there are more than 200 gerfalcons alone, without reckoning the other hawks, the Khan himself goes every week to see his birds sitting in mew, and sometimes he rides through the park with a leopard behind him on his horse's croup, and then if he sees any animal that takes his fancy, he slips his leopard at it, and the game when taken is made over to feed the hawks in mew. This he does for diversion. Moreover at a spot in the park where there is a charming wood he has another palace built of cane, of which I must give you a description. It is gilt all over and most elaborately finished inside. It is stayed on gilt and lacquered columns, on each of which is a dragon all gilt. 
the tail of which is attached to the column whilst the head supports the architrave, and the claws likewise are stretched out right and left to support the architrave. The roof, like the rest, is formed of canes, covered with a varnish so strong and excellent that no amount of rain will rot them. These canes are a good three palms in girth, and from ten to fifteen paces in length. They are cut across at each knot, and then the pieces are split so as to form from each two hollow tiles. And with these the house is roofed. Only every such tile of cane has to be nailed down to prevent the wind from lifting it. In short, the whole palace is built of these canes, which I may mention serve also for a great variety of other useful purposes. The construction of the palace is so devised that it can be taken down and put up again with great celerity, and it can all be taken to pieces and removed whithersoever the emperor may command. When erected, it is braced against mishaps from the wine by more than two hundred cords of silk. The Khan abides at this park of his, dwelling sometimes in the marble palace and sometimes in the cane palace for three months of the year, to wit. June, July and August, preferring this residence because it is by no means hot, in fact it is a very cool place. When the 28th day of the moon of August arrives he takes his departure, and the Cane Palace is taken to pieces. But I must tell you what happens when he goes away from this palace every year on the 28th of the August moon. Description by Tofan Tima the lament of Tofan Tima Khan, concerning the loss of Daidu and Haban Shandu in 1368, is recorded in many Mongolian historical chronicles. The Alton Tobshi version is translated as follows. My Daidu, straight and wonderfully made of various jewels of different kinds My Yellow Step of Xanadu, the summer residence of ancient Khans. My cool and pleasant kiping Xanadu, my dear Daidu, that I've lost on the year of the bald red rabbit, your pleasant mist when on early mornings I ascended to the heights. Lagan and Ibagu made it known to me, the sage Khan. In full knowledge I let go of dear Daidu, nobles born foolish cared not for their state, I was left alone weeping, I became like a calf left behind on its native pastures, my eight sided white strooper made of various precious objects, my city of Daidu made of the nine jewels where I sat holding the reputation of the great nation, my great square city of Daidu with four gates where I sat holding the reputation of the forty tuman Mongols, my dear. City of Daidu. The iron stair has been broke on. My reputation. My precious Daidu. From where I surveyed and observed the Mongols of every place. My city with no winter residence to spend the winter my summer residence of Kaiping Xanadu my pleasant yellow step my deadly mistake of not heeding the words of Lagan and Ibagu. The Cane Palace had been established in Sanctity Kublai the wise Khan spent his summers there. I have lost Kaiping Xanadu entirely to China. An impure bad name has come upon the sage Khan. They besieged and took precious Daidu I have lost the whole of it, to China. A conflicting bad name has come upon the sage Khan. Jewel Daidu was built with many an adornment in Kaiping Xanadu. I spent the summers in peaceful relaxation by a hapless error they have been lost, to China. A circling bad name has come upon the sage Khan. The awe-inspiring reputation carried by the Lord Khan the dear Daidu built by the extraordinary wise Khan the bejeweled hearth city, the revered sanctuary of the entire nation dear Daidu I have lost it all, to China, the sage Khan, the reincarnation of all bodhisattvas by the destiny willed by Khan Tengra has lost dear Daidu, lost the golden palace of the wise Khan, who is the reincarnation of all the gods, who is the golden seed of Genghis Khan the son of Khan Tengra. I hid the jade seal of the Lord Khan in my sleeve and left fighting through a multitude of enemies, I broke through and left. From the fighters may book a team of Chinsam for ten thousand generations become a Khan in the golden line of the Lord Khan. Caught unaware I have lost dear Daidu. When I left home, it was then that the jewel of religion and doctrine was left behind. In the future may wise and enlightened bodhisattvas take heed and understand. May it go around and establish itself on the golden lineage of Genghis Khan. Samuel Purchase
In 1614, the English clergyman Samuel Purchase published Purchase His Pilgrimus or Relations of the World and the Religions Observed in All Ages and Places, Discovered, from the Creation unto this Present. This book contained a brief description of Shangdu, based on the early description of Marco Polo. In Zandu did Kublai can build a stately palace, encompassing 16 miles of plain ground with a wall, wherein are fertile meadows, pleasant springs, delightful streams, and all sorts of beasts of chase and game, and in the midst there of a sumptuous house of pleasure which may be moved from place to place. In 1625 Purchase published an expanded edition of this book, recounting the voyages of famous travelers, called Purchase His Pilgrimess. The eleventh volume of this book included a more detailed description of Shangdu, attributed to Marco Polo and dated 1320. This city is three days' journey northeastward to the city Zandu, which the Chan Kublai now reigning built, erecting therein a marvelous and artificial palace of marble and other stones, which abutteth on the wall on one side, and the midst of the city on the other. He included sixteen miles within the circuit of the wall on that side where the palace abutteth on the city wall, into which none can enter but by the palace. In this enclosure or park are goodly meadows, springs, rivers, red and fallow deer, faunus carrying thither for the hawks, and he often useth one leopard or more, sitting on horses, which he setteth upon the stagus and deer, and having taken the beast, giveth it to the girl falcons, and in beholding this spectacle he taketh wonderful delight. In the midst in a fair wood he hath a royal house on pillars gilded and varnished, on every inch of which is a dragon all gilt, which windeth his tail about the pillar, which his head bearing up the loft, as also with his wings displayed on both sides, the cover also is of reds gilt and varnished, so that the rain can do it no injury, the reeds being three handfuls thick and ten yards log, split from knot to knot. The house itself also may be sundered, and taken down like a tent and erected again, for it is sustained, when it is set up, with two hundred silken cordus. Great Chan useth to dwell there three monoths in the year, to wit, in June, July and August. Samuel Taylor Coleridge. In 1797, according to his own account, the English poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge was reading about Shangdu in Purchase His Pilgrimus fell asleep, and had an opium-inspired dream. The dream caused him to begin the poem known as Kubla Khan. Unfortunately Coleridge's writing was interrupted by an unnamed man from Poor Lock, causing him to forget much of the dream but his images of Shangdu became one of the best-known poems in the English language. Coleridge described how he wrote the poem in the preface to his collection of poems, Christabel, Kubla Khan, and The Pains of Sleep, published in 1816. In the summer of the year 1797, the author, then in ill health, had retired to a lonely farmhouse between Porlock and Linton, on the ex-moor confines of Somerset and Devonshire. In consequence of a slight indisposition, an anodyne had been prescribed, from the effects of which he fell asleep in his chair at the moment that he was reading the following sentence, or words of the same substance, in Purchase's Pilgrimers. Here the Khan Kubla commanded a palace to be built, and a stately garden thereunto, and thus ten miles of fertile ground were enclosed with a wall. The author continued for about three hours in a profound sleep, at least of the external senses, during which time he has the most vivid confidence that he could not have composed less than from two to three hundred lines, if that indeed can be called composition in which all the images rose up before him as things with a parallel production of the correspondent expressions, without any sensation or consciousness of effort. On awakening he appeared to himself to have a distinct recollection of the whole, and taking his pen, ink, and paper, instantly and eagerly wrote down the lines that are here preserved. A person on business from Poor Lock interrupted him and he was never able to recapture more than some eight or ten scattered lines and images. Coleridge's description of Shangdu has echoes of the works of both Marco Polo and Samuel Purchase.
In his description of Shangdu, Marco Polo wrote, Round this palace a wall is built, enclosing a compass of 16 miles, and inside the park there are fountains and rivers and brooks and beautiful meadows, with all kinds of wild animals. This became, in Purchase's book Purchase His Pilgrim S. In Zandu did Kublai can build a stately palace, encompassing 16 miles of plain ground with a wall, wherein are fertile meadows, pleasant springs, delightful streams, and all sorts of beasts are chase and game, and in the midst there of a sumptuous house of pleasure, which may be moved from place to place. This became, in Coleridge's poem, in Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round, and here were gardens bright with sinuous rills, where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree, and here were forests ancient as the hills, enfolding sunny spots of greenery. Astronomy. In 2006, the International Astronomical Union named a continent-sized area of Saturn's moon Titan as Xanadu, referring to Coleridge's poem. Xanadu has raised considerable interest in scientists after its radar image showed its terrain to be quite similar to Earth's terrain with flowing rivers, mountains and sand dunes. In popular culture, thanks to the poem by Coleridge, Xanadu became a metaphor for splendor and opulence. It was the name of Charles Foster Kahn's estate in the film Citizen Kane, and also that of Mandrake the Magician in the long-running comic strip. The title of the 1980 film Xanadu is a reference to Coleridge's poem. This film starred Gene Kelly and Olivia Newton-John and was widely considered a big-budget flop. But its soundtrack spawned several hit singles for Newton John, such as the number one hit, Magic, a duet with Cliff Richard called Suddenly, and, with electric light orchestra accompaniment, the title song, Xanadu, ELO had soundtrack hits of their own with I'm Alive, and All Over the World. In the Kurt Vonnegut novel, Timequake, Xanadu is the name of a retreat for prolific writers in a resort on Cape Cod. Xanadu was featured in the short story by Ray Bradbury called A Miracle of Rare Device, written in 1962 and republished in 1964 in the collection The Machineries of Joy. The story was later made into a television episode. In Xanadu is a 1989 travel book by William Dalrymple. At the age of 22 he sets off along the Silk Road from Antioch. In early 1980, Tina Marie had a US R&B Top 40 hit with Behind the Groove that mentions Xanadu. In 1968, UK pop rock group Dave D, Dozy, Beaky, Mick and Titch had a UK number one hit with The Legend of Xanadu. Another known reference to Coleridge's poem is the song Xanadu by Canadian rock band Rush in their 1977 album A Farewell to Kings. In their debut album Welcome to the Pleasure Dome which rocketed to rank one in the UK charts in its very first week in 1984, Frankie Goes to Hollywood referred to the poem in the title track. While they changed the poem's starting line in Xanadu did Kublai Khan, a stately pleasure dome decree to in Xanadu did Kublai Khan, a pleasure dome erect. They delivered an atmospheric video that interwove contemporary mid-80s youth culture with elements of a fictitious Xanadu theme park. In the Japanese light novel and anime series Shakugan no Shana, Xanadu is the name of the paradise to be created by the god of creation. In the sci-fi, cyberpunk, fantasy novels Otherland by Tad Williams, Paul Jonas passes through a sim world or highly realistic simulation of Xanadu. As described in Coleridge's poem, Xanadu is revealed to be an alternate name for the utopian city of Tralala, a setting from the Scrooge McDuck Disney comic books. Originally created by Carl Barks and expanded on by Don Rosa in his story, Return to Xanadu, where it's revealed that Genghis Khan had the capital of his empire placed there after he occupied the city, and hid the massive treasury of the Mongol Empire in the massive underground reservoir that drained the river flowing through the city. 
creating the sunless sea mentioned in Coleridge's poem. Arthur C. Clarke wrote a parody of Coleridge's poem, describing his tumultuous experience co-scripting the film 2001. It goes, for MGM did Kubrick, Stan A. Stately Astrodome decree while art, the S.F. Writer, ran through plots incredible to man, in search of solvency. So twice five miles of Elves tree ground with sets and props were girdled round, a savage place. As eerie and enchanted as air beneath a flickering arc was haunted by child star wailing for her demon mother. For months meandering with a mazy motion through stacks of scripts the desperate writer ran then reached that plot incredible to man and sank. In scuba in the Indian Ocean, and midst the tumult Kubrick heard from far accountants' voices, prophesying war.